CD one, track three. To continue our series on famous firsts, if you ask a Brazilian who first flew an aeroplane, she'll tell you it was Alberto Santos Dumont. Ask an American, and he'll answer the Wright brothers. In 1906, Santos Dumont was widely believed to have flown the first plane that was heavier than air. Others say that the Americans Wilbur and Orville Wright first flew in 1903. The truth is, we don't really know who flew first, but Santos Dumont was certainly a colourful character. He's said to be the first person to have owned a flying machine for personal use. He kept his balloon tied up outside his Paris flat and regularly flew to restaurants. Our second question: It's commonly assumed that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, but now we're not so sure. Many people believe that Antonio Meucci, an Italian immigrant, got there first. And in 2003, files were discovered which suggest that a 26-year-old German science teacher, Philip Rice, had invented the phone 15 years before Bell. Now, who was the first to the North Pole? In 1908, Dr. Frederick Cook said he'd done it, but it's commonly believed that he lied and that a man called Robert Peary made it first. There are others who claim that neither of them reached the North Pole. The light bulb. It's widely asserted that Edison invented it, but we don't really know for sure. Edison based a lot of his inventions on other people's ideas. Also, he worked with a team, and he never shared the credit. Moving on to our football question, it's widely assumed that South America's football glory belongs to Brazil and Argentina, but it was Uruguay that hosted and won the first World Cup in 1930. They beat Argentina 4-2 in the final in front of 93,000 people in Montevideo. The cheering of the crowd is said to have been the loudest noise ever heard in Uruguay. Talking of sport, it's often thought that rugby and sheep are the main claims to fame for New Zealand. Not many people know that in 1893, New Zealand became the first country to allow women to vote. Now, talking of empowering women, one woman who has empowered herself is Ellen MacArthur. MacArthur is sometimes wrongly assumed to be the first woman to sail around the world. She wasn't. She was the fastest, but not the first. That honor goes to another English woman, Naomi James, who did it in 1979. Apparently, she got so seasick that soon afterwards she gave up sailing altogether. And our final question. The ancient Olympic Games were, of course, first held in Greece. They were quite different from the games today. Instead of money, the winners received a crown of leaves. They were also said to be allowed to put their statue up on Olympus. CD one, track four. The headlines this lunchtime are: A conservation institute in the United States has produced wild kittens by crossbreeding cloned adult cats. It is believed to be the first time that clones of wild animals have been bred. Researchers at the Audubon Center for Research of Endangered Species say that the development holds enormous potential for the preservation of endangered species. An American millionaire has succeeded in his long-held ambition to circumnavigate the world in a balloon. Fifty-eight-year-old Steve Fossett had already made five attempts on the record, but was frequently beaten back by the weather. In 1997, he was forced to land in Russia. In 1998, it was Australia, and in 2001, he found himself crash-landing on a cattle ranch in Brazil. And finally, the story of a man who has entered the record books as the world's most renowned eater of burgers. It is estimated that Don Gorski has eaten over fifteen thousand Big Macs, and he even proposed to his girlfriend Mary in the car park of a McDonald's. In fifteen years, he says he has missed a Big Mac on only seven occasions, including the death of his mother, a snowstorm, and a six hundred mile drive without a McDonald's in sight. CD one, track five. One, a conservation institute in the United States has produced wild kittens by crossbreeding cloned adult cats. Two, 
An American millionaire has succeeded in his long-held ambition to circumnavigate the world in a balloon. Three. And finally, the story of a man who has entered the record books as the world's most renowned eater of burgers. CD one, track six. One. When I was at school, a friend of mine was injured in an accident while playing rugby. He was paralysed and needed to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Together with some friends, we decided to organise a sponsored bike ride to raise money for his family and other people in a similar situation. So we set up a charity called One Step Ahead and arranged to cycle from Scotland to Gibraltar. I'd never done anything like that before, so it was a fantastic learning experience. I'd always thought it would be great to cycle across a whole country, but this exceeded my expectations. There were about twenty or thirty of us on bikes, and the rest of the crew in vans with all the equipment and camping gear. It was very tough cycling, especially in Spain, where we had to battle against the heat. But we had a fantastic time, and at the end, when we arrived, there was a huge party for us, and the media came and took photos. <laughs> we were even on the news. We felt we'd accomplished something quite important, and we raised lots of money for people with spinal injury too. Two. I've been doing volunteer work here in the rainforest in Brazil for a while now. Next week, I'll have been here for three months, helping to teach English to the young children in the village. It's been an amazing experience because I'd never even left Europe before, so you can imagine how different things are here. When I arrived, I really didn't know what to expect. It was a real culture shock, and I was here on my own for the first couple of months. Now my girlfriend has come out to join me, and things are a bit easier. I've been living with a small tribe of people right out in the forest, and I had never done any teaching before either, so the whole thing has been quite a challenge, and I've learnt a lot. But some of the children are speaking quite good English with me now, and a few of them are starting to write little stories too. So I feel it's been quite an achievement. Three. I've run a marathon. In fact, I'm planning to run it again this year. I did it last year for the first time, and it was great. It felt like a major achievement. I had to train really hard, getting up early in the morning to run before going to work. And as the distances got longer, I had to get up earlier and earlier. And it was incredibly hard because I'd never done any training like that before. I've always run, but just for myself to relax and to keep fit. But this was a chance to be more competitive and really push myself to the limit. It is a fantastic run because London is a beautiful city. And there's such a good atmosphere as you go along the route with people cheering you on. My parents even came over from New Zealand to see me arrive at the finish. I couldn't move for about a week afterwards last time, but I was glad I'd done it, and I'm looking forward to the next one. CD one, track seven, one. Jake, this is my friend Amy, who I've known for absolutely ages. Two. I asked what had happened, but nobody could tell me. Three. I chose this school because I'd heard it was the best. Four. He should have finished by the time we get back. Five. Before I came to the U.S., I'd never been abroad. Six. I'm so exhausted. I've been working really hard. Seven. By the time she retires, she'll have been working there for more than fifty years. Eight. I'll phone you as soon as we've arrived. CD one, track eight. If you ticked mainly A, then you seem to be very comfortable as you are, and you're not too keen on new challenges. I think you need to make an effort to get off the sofa. Go on, take a risk. It might have a positive effect. Now, if your answers were mainly B, it means you love a challenge and you take advantage of your opportunities. You seem willing to have a go at anything and everything. So good luck, but be careful. Those of you who ticked mainly C, well, you obviously make a habit of checking everything before committing yourself. You are super cautious. Well, you may live a long, safe life, 
but a bit of a challenge from time to time won't do you any harm. CD1, track 9. 1. I'm from South Africa. I spent two and a half years, actually more like two years, living in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, my wife and I were trying to set up our own business there as packagers in the publishing industry. Unfortunately, things were not going very well economically. Canada wasn't in a depression, but it was just not a very good time to try and start your own business in publishing. What did I like about Vancouver? Well, Vancouver is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. In fact, Vancouver is regularly named as the best place in the world to live. Stunningly beautiful because of mountains, sea, forests and natural beauty and for me combined with a large city. Vancouver is a city where you can walk to the beach. Vancouver is a city where the beaches are right in the city and you can go to the beach for your lunch break. You can take a bus and go skiing in the mountains 40 minutes later. Canadian food of course is not at the top of the world's list of good food, but Vancouver has got a very large Chinese population, Indian population, and of course, as the rest of Canada, people from all over the world. So you can eat extraordinarily good food in Vancouver. Um, the only food that people might consider uniquely Vancouverite is what they would call fusion cuisine, which is food prepared by chefs that mix their diverse background from Asia or Europe and integrated with the local foods. And in fact, you can have a very good meal that way. My best memories about Canada? Well, the open spaces, the vastness, and the friendly people as well. Two. I'm from Belfast originally, but over the past 10 years, I've been living, um, I've lived in Spain, Austria, France, and other parts of the UK. Um, I lived in Austria for a year when I was about 22, 23. It was a gap year from university. Uh, I was studying German, so I wanted to spend a year there. I was a teaching assistant there. I worked in a school four days a week, so it was really great because it meant I had long weekends. Um, I usually went traveling with my friends at the weekends. Um, we went to Slovenia, Prague, Italy, Germany. And the best thing was um, I pretended I was 15 so that I could get some real discount. I got half price train tickets, which was excellent. And the other great things about living there was obviously skiing and ice skating on lakes, which you can't do in Northern Ireland. And obviously the scenery is beautiful. The people were lovely. The thing I didn't really like was the food because I'm vegetarian and in Austria they tend to eat a lot of meat. But apart from that, everything else was great. Um, I think my favorite memories of Austria are the scenery, being able to go up into the mountain after school every afternoon and go skiing or swimming in the lakes in the summer. And I'd definitely like to go back one day. Three. Well, I lived in Japan, uh, in, actually in Tokyo, um, for about two years. This was about two years ago now. Um, it was, as you can imagine, a completely crazy experience for me, coming from Oxford, which is a very you know, small, provincial, very quiet kind of town. Um, I was living in Tokyo because I was working as an English language teacher for a really tiny um, language school run by this lovely, lovely old lady um, in a suburb of Tokyo. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed Tokyo. It was such an interesting experience. It was like being, you know, dropped in the middle of a lifestyle that was completely different to my own. Um, even going to the supermarket was a massive adventure because, of course, I couldn't read anything because the, the writing system's so different. So I'd sort of pick up a tin and think, oh, that looks interesting. I'll take, I'll take that home and have a, you know, see what comes out. And got a few surprises, of course, a few unidentifiable foods that I'd never seen before, but that's always a good thing. Um, I think my favorite memories of the country would have to be the people. Because I was teaching English, I, I knew a lot of, of Japanese people as students, as colleagues in the school and so on. And I just found them so lovely. They were friendly, funny, 
really interested in what a foreigner like me was doing in Tokyo and very keen to, you know, share experiences of travelling abroad and to, to tell me all about the social customs in Japan and, and things like that. So it was, a, it was a really rewarding experience, absolutely great. CD1, track 10. It's made such a big difference to me. I mean, communication is miles easier than it was before. Do you remember the days when we had to go through all that hassle of writing letters? Sure, I'd agree with that, but I'd still say that face-to-face -face communication is better. Sending an email is nowhere near as personal and meaningful as a conversation. Well, it depends, doesn't it? On what? OK, an email is nothing like as good as seeing someone you love or your friends or something. But I can tell you this much. Rather than going to see my clients every day or nattering on the phone, I'm much better off sending them an email. It saves time. Yeah, I see what you're getting at. But I just think the more we use email, the more we need it. It's like an addiction, with people checking their emails every five minutes, even in meetings. Fair enough. But I'd still rather have it than not. And, well, the internet in general. There's so much rubbish on there. Do you use it to do research? All the time. I think it's OK. Maybe it's not quite as good as looking books. Well, it's not as reliable, though it's considerably faster. I'd say that looking up something on the internet is marginally less reliable than shouting out of the window, Does anybody know the answer to this? <laughs> it's not regulated, is it? Anyone can publish anything on the internet and it may or may not be true. Hmm. Much the best thing about the internet is that it lets you do things more cheaply than before, like buying holidays, buying stuff on eBay. I've never used eBay. Or oh, Amazon. You can get loads of cheap books. Yeah, but I'd sooner go to a second-hand bookshop. I'm not into the idea of giving my bank details over the internet. No way! There are lots of security measures these days, you know. For instance... CD1, track 11. One. Um, I'm a member of an old boys club, um, which is basically when, when you leave school, you keep in touch with your old friends, and every five or ten years you have a reunion and you get together and party and remember the old days. Um, some good, some bad, obviously. Um, we also get involved in quite a few charity events in the area where I'm from. Um, and recently, we actually did some charity events to save the school that I was at, which was going to be closed. So that was something we did specially. I, did it, I didn't join straight after school. Um, I went abroad for a few years. And I found out about it through a website uh, called Friends Reunited, where you can find where your old friends are and your old school is. And that was great. We probably only meet once every two years as a group. Um, we have a big party and uh, get to meet all the people that we remember and some of the teachers as well, uh, which is fun. What's really interesting about the group is that we've now all known each other for about 20 years and it's so interesting to meet people every two years and see how they've changed. Um, I'm sure that if I met some of those people in the street now after 20 years, I wouldn't recognise them. And in in a, in a bad sort of way, I suppose, it's you like to measure yourself against your friends, where they've got to and how have you done in comparison. Um, if there's something I don't like is that um, it's very difficult to keep in touch when you're not meeting so regularly. Um, and you do rely on other people to run the club and sometimes people aren't as involved as they should be and sometimes you don't hear anything for a year or two. So it is quite difficult to do. But I will definitely stick with it because it's great to meet people and remember some of the good days. Two. Well, I'm a member of a, of a, of a kind of society, I suppose. It's a, it's a ballroom dancing club. Um, we, it's kind of lessons, but it's so social as well. There's about, oh, I suppose there must be about 30 people in the club. And I think I'm quite unusual because I think I'm the youngest there. Um, I go with a friend of mine um, who, who is my partner in, in the dancing. Um, it's great fun, really great fun. It's kind of fun being the youngest there as well because everyone else is retired and they think we're very cool and exotic for being young. Um, joined about, I suppose, six months ago now um, because I've, I've just fancied giving ballroom dancing a go. I've never been terribly coordinated as a dancer and I'm not very good with choreography. But it's been absolutely great. I mean, there's quite a lot of beginners in the class, so you never really feel like you're, you know, stuck out in the middle of all these wonderful advanced dancers. Um, we meet once a week, and we meet in a, in a school hall in a local suburb near to where I live. 
Um, we meet in the evenings after work and sometimes it can be quite hard to get yourself out of the house again and ready to do some exercise and some dancing. But it's fantastic fun. So far we've been learning um, the waltz, the foxtrot um, and some Latin dances like um, the jive and the tango. It's great fun. CD1, track 12. In 1957, a news programme called Panorama broadcast a story about spaghetti trees in Switzerland. While the reporter told the story, Swiss farmers in the background were picking spaghetti from trees. Following this, thousands of people called the show asking how to grow spaghetti trees. In 1998, large numbers of Americans went to Burger King asking for a new type of burger. The food company had published an ad in USA Today announcing the new Left-Handed Whopper, a burger designed for left-handed people. The following day, Burger King admitted that they had been joking all along. Swedish technician Kjell Stenson had been working on the development of Colour TV for many years when he announced in 1962 that everyone could now convert their black and white TV sets into colour. The procedure was simple you had to put a nylon stocking over the TV screen. Stenson demonstrated and fooled thousands. Pretending that it had been developing the product for some time, a British supermarket announced in 2002 that it had invented a whistling carrot. Using genetic engineering, the carrot grew with holes in it, and when cooked, it would start whistling. CD1, track 13. 1. I'd seen it before. 2. I'd prefer to go home. 3. She'd lost the opportunity. 4. Would you like to dance? 5. I didn't set the alarm. 6. What would you cook? 7. I'd have done the same. 8. Had she been there? CD1, track 14. 1. My favourite fictional character has to be Philip Marlowe, the detective created by Raymond Chandler. The most famous book and movie in which he appears is, of course, The Big Sleep, with um, Humphrey Bogart playing Philip Marlowe. Once you've seen Humphrey Bogart, of course, it's very difficult to imagine Philip Marlowe as being anybody else other than Humphrey Bogart, because like Humphrey Bogart, Philip Marlowe is tall, good-looking, tough, very smart, and a smooth talker. And I suppose those are also the characteristics that I do like about Philip Marlowe. The thing about Philip Marlowe is, like, unlike most modern characters, he doesn't always say the right thing, although he always has a clever retort, and he doesn't always win. Philip Marlowe is not always on top of the situation. Philip Marlowe sounds like a real guy with real problems, who's very clever, very tough, and likes to get to the bottom of the problem. Um, the sort of problems that he has to overcome, of course, as a detective in Los Angeles, is generally solving murder crimes. But he's often not so much interested in who did it as to why or how. By the end of the story, you care, much about, you care as much about the, um, the victim as perhaps the murderer or Philip Marlowe himself. This is actually one reason why you can reread and reread the Raymond Chandler novels with Philip Marlowe in them, because it's not what happens in the story, it's how Philip Marlowe deals with the problems that matters. Two. I think my favourite fictional character has to be um, the lead character, the heroine, if you like, of um, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. She's absolutely, I think, one of the best drawn characters in, in English literature. She is, of course, Elizabeth Bennet. Um, she's heroine, she's, she's sparky, she's lively, she's feisty. And when you think that this is a book that's set in the 1800s, it's really quite remarkable that you've got such a modern woman as the heroine. I mean, she's, she's lippy, she talks back to all these men who are older than her and in more authority than her. Fantastic. I think it's a character traits that I'd really quite like to have myself. Um, 
I imagine her, and I think I'm quite influenced here by the films and so on that have been made of Pride and Prejudice, as being quite tall with a very lively, mobile face and possibly dark hair as well. Um, memorable things that she does. Well, the thing that I really like about her um, from the story of Pride and Prejudice is the way that she takes control of her own life in a period of history when women really had very little power and very little control over what happened to them in the marriage market. And I think it's great that she um, sort of comes to a self-realisation through the events in the novel and decides to do the right thing and go for the guy that she really loves. And of course she meets lots of problems along the way. People who think she's socially unacceptable, or people who um, have very prejudiced views about class and society. And of course she succeeds and she wins the day, wins her guy in the end. Three. I think my favourite fictional character was uh, the old man from The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, I still have quite a, a strong visual image of this man. Uh, the whole story takes place in, in a boat off the coast of Cuba, uh, with, with, with just this one character, mostly. I imagine him to be quite old. He was a lifelong fisherman. Uh, he had quite a tough life. So I imagine he had these really big, strong hands that were, were, were cut and, and bruised from hauling in nets his whole life, every, every night out on, out on the sea. Uh, imagine him with a little bit of grey hair, uh, just old and wise. Uh, somebody who had been a fisherman his, his whole life, took a lot of pride in it and, and tried to do it as, as best he could. And he was down on his luck in the story. He hadn't caught anything for quite a long time. Um, but he still dragged himself out every night and cast his nets and, and, and hoped, for, hoped that he would catch something. In a way, he sort of reminds me of my dad somebody who had limited opportunities in life but found a job that he could do and, and, and did it to the best of his ability even though there was very little glamour attached to it and I think this in a way was what the fisherman was like. He, he was a fisherman and he took pride in that and, and did the best job he could. CD1, track 15. Groucho Marx didn't want to be a comedian at first. He loved reading and singing, and he wanted to become a doctor. But his mother had other ideas. She got the boys to start a group called the Six Mascots. During a radio show, they started making jokes, and this is when they decided to become a comedy act. Their popularity grew quickly, but in 1926, the boys' mother died and the Great Depression began. In the 1930s, a man called Irving Thalberg helped the Marx Brothers to get on television. They made their most famous films, the last of which was called A Day at the Races. After this, Groucho became a radio host, and he also made more movies, but without his brothers. In the 70s, he toured with a live one-man show, but by now in his 90s, he was getting weaker, and he died in 1977 on the same day as Elvis Presley.